morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I'm excited to be here with you today to talk about the responsible use of AI in healthcare. Today, I will um, talk about applications of artificial intelligence in healthcare, some of the opportunities and challenges we face when using AI in healthcare. I'm gonna discuss the concept of responsible use and how strategies for putting responsible use uh, into practice. So before, um, before getting too far into the session, I wanted to level set on what I mean when I say AI. My experience has been that people use AI and data science to mean different things. Um, during the presentation, when I say AI, I am referring to a set of computational methods that allow a computer system to function and think and learn how to complete tasks that normally require human intelligence. And so if we think about AI computational methods, being able to enable a computer to think and learn like a human, it begs the question, you know, what is the role of AI in healthcare? And should we be using AI solutions to replace human judgment? Can we be more consistent and accurate and actually fair in healthcare by replacing human judgment with numerical models? Makes me think about will the doctor of the future actually be a robot? And I, I would ask you to just think about that for a moment. Like, how does that feel? Um, think about what it would be like for you to be treated by a robot. The legendary sci-fi television show, Star Trek, presented a futuristic view of medicine. And in the, in the 60s and 70s, there was a doctor known as Bones, um, who was, he was a human, he was, he was aided by computers and um, these like futuristic scanners, right? That would scan folks' bodies and he could diagnose um, the conditions they had and, and, and treat them using these powerful scanners. Um, in more recent versions of, of this television series, uh, the doctor has now been replaced by a hologram. And if we, if we look at these two kind of different, but similar in some ways, um, imaginations of what the doctor of the future might look like, what, what commonalities do you see? Um, apart from both of them being middle-aged white guys, um, there is a human component here. We are not, the, the, the doctor of the future is not being envisioned to be like a C3PO or R2D2 from Star Wars, right? There's a human component here, even with the hologram. And when we think about clinicians being with folks when they are at their most vulnerable, when we are weak, we actually, we want a human connection. And that's a big part of caregiving. Um, to me, this gets to the art and science of medicine. And I apologize for the long quote on the screen here, but I really appreciate the words of Dr. Stephen Clasco, who was the editor of Healthcare Transformation in 2016. Dr. Clasco predicts that AI will enable physicians to get back to the role of guide. He says the one thing human beings can do that no robot can do is to actually be human. And that doctors can help patients make sense of what is happening to them and bring meaning to their experience. And he gives this very poignant example of a couple who has unexpectedly delivered a Down syndrome baby. And he says, you know, at that moment, what the parents need is they don't need a medical definition of Downs or a list of all the potential health and developmental challenges that their infant might face. But what they need is for a doctor to say, what this means is you've delivered a beautiful baby, it means your baby will grow and love and be loved 
and it means that we're going to help you um, and link you up with some parents who have other who have beautiful babies like yours so you'll know best how to care for them the american medical association has purposefully chosen to use the term augmented intelligence to describe its use of AI computational methods. And the reasoning behind this is that augmented intelligence infers the use of AI to enhance and scale human clinical decision-making as opposed to replacing it. And I think this is an important distinction from other industries, this idea that this premise that care will, will and should always be led by human clinical decision making, that we're not going to hand over the reins entirely to, um, to artificial intelligence. The great news is that there are countless opportunities to use AI to enhance and scale healthcare delivery. From a quality perspective, AI computational methods can be used for clinical decision support. ML models can be used to predict the onset of disease and the risk of disease progression. It can be used to improve identification of patients with rare disease. And we, we know that computers can do a much better job than the human eye at interpreting medical images. ML machine learning models can be used to enhance patient outreach and engagement. And from an efficiency perspective, AI holds promise as a means to improve speed to diagnosis. And it can improve identification of fraud, waste, and abuse in healthcare delivery. Um, one of the ways that uh, me and my team have actually used uh, machine learning models to support detection of fraud, waste, and abuse is in pharmacies. And we have a, at Optum, we have a, a, a pharmacy benefits manager. We have a pharmacy benefits program that routinely audits pharmacies for fraudulent behavior. Uh, the process that we've used for a long, long time had a very low hit rate which means we would go out and manually audit pharmacies. And maybe 40% of the time, we would actually identify a pharmacy that had engaged in some type of fraudulent behavior. After deploying our machine learning model, we moved from 40% hit rate to over 80%. So tremendous improvement <laughs> in our ability to detect fraud. Um, we have also used machine learning methods to improve inventory optimization. And if you think about the costs associated with just maintaining inventory, durable medical equipment, um, medications at a hospital pharmacy, there's incredible potential to use machine learning techniques to help improve efficiency. So AI holds tremendous promise but like all analytic methods, it also poses some challenges. And as an analytic community, we should all commit to responsible use of these powerful methods. We are always accountable for the integrity of our work and the model results that we unleash into the world. Um, particularly in healthcare, the bar is set very high because the stakes are high. Um, our models and outputs are potentially informing treatment decisions for patients. So we are always accountable for the validity and reliability of our analytic results. We also must understand and clearly communicate the strengths and limitations of the data and methods that we use. We must provide transparency around the data and our model outputs. And for me and my organization, responsible use is also a commitment to promote health equity and proactively take steps to prevent the exacerbation or introduction of bias due to socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, religion, gender, disability, or sexual orientation. 
Next, I'd like to walk through some of the healthcare data challenges and model limitations we face when using AI in healthcare. A common data challenge we face is incomplete or missing data. And due to the fractured nature of the US healthcare system and the variation in how healthcare data is collected and managed, rarely, if ever, do health researchers have access to all of the clinical data they would like to have to support model development? So consider a case where you have been asked to develop a machine learning model to predict the likelihood of disease progression among a diabetic patient population. What clinical data might you want to access? Perhaps you'd like to see how often the patient is going in to get their A1C checked. You might wanna know if this patient uses a continuous glucose monitor. You may wanna know what is the current severity of the patient's disease? Does their family have a history of type two diabetes? What are their health beliefs? All of these types of data are stored in different systems and different platforms. They may exist in claims data, in health, electronic health records <laughs> data. Increasingly, in addition to clinical data, other data you may be interested in is social determinants of health. And social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. So it's commonly acknowledged that healthcare is one of just many factors that contribute to an individual's health. So back to the diabetes example. In addition to knowing what kind of health care the individual has received, you may wanna know about their economic stability. Is this, is this patient able to afford their health care? Do they experience stress due to financial duress? Do they have stable housing? Do they live in a neighborhood that is safe, that's walkable, um, where it's easy to get out and, and get some exercise? What is the individual's health literacy and educational background? Is this an individual who's experiencing food insecurity? Do they live in an area where it's easy to access healthy food options? And last but not least, what does the social support system look like for this patient? We know from the literature that social isolation can strongly affect health outcomes among patients. So it can be challenging to figure out how to find, access all of this information about the patients you're interested in studying, and then actually link it all together so you can use it to support model development. Another common healthcare data challenge we run into is small sample sizes. Um, this is definitely an issue when we want to study rare diseases or if we're interested in studying newly approved treatments and therapies. But the other truth we know is that healthcare data sets are skewed toward people who access and use quality and timely healthcare. And data deserts exist for groups that experience barriers to care. And these barriers to care are more prevalent among certain racial and ethnic subsets of the US population. These barriers may be things like the high cost of care, having inadequate insurance or no healthcare insurance, there being a lack of available services, folks who live in rural areas and may not have access to clinics. And then also a lack of culturally competent care can interfere with someone's access to services. And while it's true that we have less healthcare data on some racial and ethnic subgroups of our population due to barriers of, of, to care, it's also true that some segments of the population are underrepresented in our data assets due to a lack of trust in the healthcare system. Sadly, we have an appalling and shameful history in the US of medical experimentation. 
and, and this medical experimentation has occurred in the not too distant past. There's the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study, which started in 1932, where 600 African-American men were told they had bad blood and were recruited to participate in a study with the promise of free medical care. The study included 399 men who had latent syphilis and 201 who had no signs of the disease. The men were monitored by healthcare workers, but they were only given placebos, such as aspirin and mineral supplements, despite the fact that penicillin had actually become the standard of care, um, standard treatment for syphilis in 1947. So these um, patients were followed for years and years and received no effective care. Men died, they went blind or insane, or even experienced other severe health problems due to their untreated syphilis. And it wasn't until the early, uh, in 1972, when a researcher questioned the, eth the ethics of the study and actually leaked it to a reporter that the Tuskegee study actually um, was picked up by the Associated Press and public outrage uh, led to the study being shut down. The U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission funded radiation experiments for years. Uh, the picture to the right here, the second picture, is a picture of a gentleman by the name of Virtus Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman, at age five, was one of nine children that took part in one of these studies. The study left him horribly disfigured. And for the rest of his life, he wore a hat, he wore a knit cap at all times to cover up his disfigurement. There's a documentary on um, Mr. Hardiman that I would encourage you to uh, look up and, and hear more about his story. But even as recently as the 1990, as 1990 um, researchers at Arizona State University uh, conducted a study looking at type two diabetes among uh, a Native American tribe. And the reason they did the research was half, they were finding that half of the adult population of this Havasupi tribe were actually, um, actually had type two diabetes. And so they recruited 400 participants and as part of the study, they collected and tested blood samples and DNA samples. In 2003, one of the participants discovered their sample, which had been donated for type 2 diabetes research, was also being used in non-diabetes research. It was being used to study schizophrenia, ethnic migration, and population inbreeding all of which are taboo topics in the Havasupi culture. So I, I would just posit that yes, there are access issues that prevent certain subsets of the population from receiving care, but they also use less care due to a lack of trust in the medical system. Another challenge we face when using healthcare data is that it is a reflection of the historical and systemic bias in healthcare delivery. A straightforward example of this is the use of race corrections in clinical guidelines that lead to more resources being directed to white patients than non-white patients. In cardiology, there's a heart failure risk score used where black patients receive lower risk scores than non-black patients. This is despite the fact that blacks are two to three times more likely to die from heart disease. With pain management, research has shown that black and Hispanic patients are less likely to receive pain medication than white patients. Even when they're 
pain scores are higher than their white counterparts. Physicians use the VBAC risk calculator to inform recommendations on whether or not a pregnant mom should have a vaginal birth after a C-section. Black women are placed at higher risk for VBAC and as a result have fewer opportunities for VBAC. Even though the data show that C-section deliveries contribute to higher maternal mortality rates among black women. And lastly, a well popular, a well, um, a well uh, known example of these race corrections is in estimated glomerular filtration rate. EGFR is a commonly used risk score for chronic kidney disease. And physicians use EGFR to stage patients' chronic kidney disease. The commonly used versions of EGFR have a race correction for African Americans. This race correction overestimates how well Black patients' kidneys function and ultimately may lead to delayed or inappropriate treatment and generally worse outcomes for Black patients with chronic kidney disease. And recently, um, there was a joint commission task force of the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology. Um, and just within the last month, they came out with a recommendation to eliminate the race correction in EGFR. Early on in my career, I, uh, I worked for a survey research company and um, a, a dear friend of mine <laughs> and colleague once said to me, Meg, you know, data is like sausage. Sometimes you don't know what's in it, but you eat it. And with, with AI and machine learning's heavy reliance on data, on big data, this is something I, I think about often. And I would strongly encourage you to be educated consumers of the data that you are eating. You know, at the end of the day, as analysts and researchers, we are accountable for the validity and reliability of the analytic results we produce and unleash into the world. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about the importance of transparency. In the mid-1990s, some researchers at Carnegie Mellon University were conducting a study to better understand pneumonia. And at that time, pneumonia was the sixth leading cause of death in the US. So they built a mach uh, machine learning model to predict which pneumonia patients were at greatest risk of death. And this was to inform whether patients should receive treatment in an inpatient or an outpatient setting. One of the rules-based models showed that if a patient had asthma, they were at low risk of mortality and should be treated in an outpatient setting. And the analyst that, that created this model looked at that and said, hmm, that, that doesn't seem right to me that asthmatics would be a low risk population when it came to pneumonia. So he shared those results with one of the physicians on the team and the physician said, that is unilaterally false. Um, as it turns out, asthmatics are at the greatest risk of death uh, due to pneumonia. And frequently, if a, if a person with asthma is diagnosed with pneumonia, they are immediately admitted to the intensive care unit at a hospital for treatment. So the model had detected that asthmatics were less likely to die from pneumonia than the general population, but it was actually precisely because they received an elevated level of care. So had the research team not been able to review the logic of the model, the results could have been devastating.
Because we know there is bias in our society and healthcare delivery, and that this shows up in our data assets, me and my analytics colleagues at Optum have committed to do fairness testing as part of our model development process. And fairness testing can be tricky because you have to define what fair means. So think about if you were asked to develop a model to inform the distribution of COVID vaccine. How would you think about fairness? How would you think about which populations need to be prioritized? And what would you want to do to make sure that the, the vaccine was distributed in an equitable and fair way? Where I work at Optum, we have we identified an open source tool to use for fairness testing when developing machine learning models. Now, these tools don't actually fix the bias in models, but they can shed a light on where bias may be occurring. It can help you determine whether the model you've created works better for some segments of the population than others. And it can help us understand if we deploy this model, would it potentially lead to disparate allocation of resources across different patient populations? So I started my talk with a lot of excitement about the use of AI in healthcare, and now I've shared some cautionary tales about how healthcare data and some of the and some of the limitations of AI models can lead us astray. So what is an analyst to do? Uh, next, I'd like to share some strategies we're using at Optum to address the challenges of AI so we can reap the benefits of all it has to offer, but do it in a thoughtful and intentional way. The foundation of this work is to establish a culture of responsible use. So we convened a committee of subject matter experts from across the enterprise with expertise in analytics. Um, we had folks from our tech teams, uh, clinical thought leaders, and even folks from our legal and regulatory team to be a part of this committee and to help us think about how to enable responsible use of AI at our organization. One of the first things we undertook was to prepare a set of corporate guiding principles. And we consider this a statement of intention. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that whenever we use AI, we will do so to advance our mission to help people live healthier lives and to help make the healthcare system work better for everyone. Our principles, we shared these principles broadly across our organization with executive leadership, um, with our product leaders uh, and all of our analytics staff and both the users. So the users of our AI output as well as the creators are beholden to these principles. And when we distributed these guiding principles, we also reserved the right to learn from our experience and to update them based on lessons learned. Then we created a central hub for tools and frameworks for our analytic teams to help them turn those guiding principles into practice. So folks can go on to this um, central hub site and not only view our guiding principles, but get access to tools and frameworks, as well as curated educational resources and training. Another recommendation I would make to healthcare organizations who are using AI is that they embed fairness testing in their model development process. 
And as I mentioned before, there are a number of different open source bias detection tools uh, that teams can use to test for fairness. Um, and I would just encourage you to go out there and check them out and um, figure out which might work best for your team and your organization. And then train your analysts to use those tools and require fairness testing be done before deploying models. Because we wanna prevent, again, the introduction or exacerbation of existing biases that can lead to disparate um, health outcomes. I also recommend that organizations set the expectation that all AI models they produce are going to be regularly assessed after they're deployed to make sure that the models are doing what they were intended to do and to determine whether or not a model needs to be retrained. This is um, where I work. Uh, defining a monitoring plan for our models is part of our model development process. And it's especially important in healthcare because healthcare is continually evolving as new treatments and technologies are developed and are released. Also, healthcare policies and regulations are always changing. And these things impact people's access to care, their use of care, and ultimately their outcomes. So we, before we release any model, we come up with a plan for how we're going to monitor it. We also wanna make sure that models are being appropriately used by end users. An AI algorithm can inadvertently produce inequities if it's not used as intended. So training and oversight by human experts is tantamount to seeing that models are being used properly and are generating um, the intended result. Another strategy my organization has committed to is to develop a diverse workforce. Our human capital partners have developed a very thoughtful recruitment process that reaches out to candidates in all of the communities that our organization serves. We provide inclusion and diversity training to employees, and we have also made financial investments in programs to support diversity in our future workforce. So a few years ago, our organization and the Atlanta University Center Consortium, one of the oldest and largest consortiums of historically black colleges and universities, partnered on an initiative to prepare students for careers in data science. All the research shows that having a diverse team fosters innovation and creativity whenever you are engaging in a process that values an array of experiences. And having diversity at the table on your model development team helps shed light on unconscious bias and improves our ability to proactively detect and address sources of bias. Lastly, my organization has committed resources to research root causes of bias and discrimination in healthcare that lead to disparate outcomes. So another, uh, as I mentioned, as I brought up earlier, we are um, kicking off a series of research projects to look at the impact of race corrections and clinical guidelines. And this is another piece to responsible use because this knowledge will help us be better informed consumers of AI derived results and just be more aware of the sources and risks of perpetuating bias. So the opportunities to advance the quality and efficiency of healthcare through the use of AI is tremendous, but we must do so in a thoughtful and intentional manner and employ a proactive strategy of responsible use. 
I hope this presentation has given you some good food for thought. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. And at this time, I would be happy um, to open the floor to discussion and answer any questions you may have. So please feel free to submit your questions in the chat.